Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today in honor of Indigenous Peoples Day. We are so incredibly excited to offer you this program. Today, Elizabeth James Perry will be leading you through this workshop, exploring sustainable art inspired by native corn husk weaving that celebrates the harvest season. Elizabeth is an enrolled member of the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead Aquina, a multimedium tradition and contemporary artist. As the owner of original wampum art, Elizabeth makes distinctive Northeast wampum, wampum shell jewelry, porcupine quill work, and textiles, traditional crafts passed down through generations. She cultivates many of the plants used in natural dyes at her home in Dartmouth, and the rest is wild, wild harvested in a sustainable way. Use this as a time to learn a new skill, have fun, be creative, resourceful, and find ways to educate yourself and others about indigenous art and culture. If you have any questions during the workshop, just drop them in the chat box and they'll be answered throughout the workshop. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm gonna start my presentation today uh, on Indigenous Peoples Day with a quick PowerPoint introducing my work and also introducing the topic, which is corn husk weaving. Um, and so let me just queue up my PDF. Um, so my, the topic of my presentation today is Wampanoag Arts in Eastern Massachusetts and Rhode Island, traditional corn husk. Um, if you're not familiar with our Northeastern territory um, in Massachusetts, uh, Wampanoags are in Eastern Mass and Rhode Island, including Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. My community of Aquina is actually on Martha's Vineyard and I've included a photograph of Nope, which is our word for Martha's Vineyard in my slideshow today. Um, those are the cliffs that my community is so well known for that are uniquely multicolored, beautiful clay. Um, there's a lot of really lovely colors in nature that inspires my work. And um, among our traditional weaving materials, we count the corn husk. Um, corn husk is something that you have access to every single year. You raise it in your garden. Uh, corn is a big part of native diet. If you like roasted corn or corn chowder or succotash, you're eating uh, essentially native dishes that go way back for thousands of years in different parts of the country. Um, the corn leaves themselves, as you can see, are quite thick and they're used for weaving. What I'm going to be using today is the corn husk, which is the husk that comes right off of the ear of corn. So honestly, if you're buying corn in the supermarket, you can peel the corn husk yourself rinse it off, lay it on, um, you know, maybe baking sheets or something like that to dry thoroughly, just turn it over, put it on paper towels maybe. And there you have a ready-made natural weaving material. It's non-toxic, it's accessible, it's um, got a unique texture and it's also very durable. I have a photograph, um, uh, I, I should say watercolor of my tribal territory um, in the upper right hand corner of the slide. So you can see Martha's Vineyard is the island right before uh, Nantucket. Um, so you can see where my community is located. I have some images also of some dyed corn husk that I've done in the past. I've used matter root, I've used sunflower petals, I've used black walnut. There's black walnut in the lower corner of the slide, um, dyeing the corn husk a beautiful rich brown. So I have some of that to use today along with the natural for a, a nice visual contrast. I do a variety of programs at museums. Um, up until now during the pandemic, a lot of my work has been hands-on. So I've gone to the Evergreen Longhouse um, at Evergreen College and given dye workshop programs for the basketry artists in the Northwest Coast. You can see in the um, upper image that we were using a combination of all sorts of plants and roots and also minerals to you know, modify the colors and make them permanent as well. And here is a close up of some corn husk weaving. You can see how the stitches look together. You can see how the colors um, come through in the corn husk. You can dye them quite strong colors. Um, generally, I recommend using natural dyes because they're non toxic. Uh, you know, you can, of course, buy RIT dyes. You could try food coloring. Um, generally, I, I, you know, food coloring is food safe. Um, natural dyes are things like black walnut husk that you can just gather this time of year. If you know, if you have producing trees, you might gather some. Um, you know, I have right here with me a container of some blueberries that would you know boil up really well and make a nice dye. Maybe adding some vinegar to to make the color permanent. 
I also have, um, I had frozen them, so they're a little bit duller looking, but these are all sunflower petals. I also gather Jerusalem artichoke petals. They're a nice yellow. Um, if you grow them, you know, whether decoratively or, you know, for sustenance in your garden, you just need to remember what, during the flowering season in the summer or, you know, my Jerusalem artichoke blooms in, um, in September. I just need to get out there in time before the storms kind of damage the petals or knock them off and gather a bunch of the petals. So it's a, a ready-made dye, it's natural, it's quite beautiful. And the sunflower petals actually have a really pleasant scent when you're using them as well. And so these are all of the different kinds of things that you can use to color your work if you wanna make a de decorative panel or a mat or some other item. When I'm not doing um, basketry or twined weaving um, with different natural plant fibers, I create wampum art, which is a shell jewelry that I'm pretty well known for in the region. Um, these are some examples of my work that's on exhibit currently at the New Bedford Whaling Museum called Ripples Through a Wampanoag Lens. Um, you can see where I've used natural dyes on the plant fiber that I used on the necklaces, the whale necklaces at the left, and the corn necklace, appropriately enough for today, on the right. Um, and so you can see how those natural dyes do look really nice, actually, on different materials. You can also get some, you know, hemp yarn or something like that, cotton yarn, and try the natural dyes on those if you want to try it at home. This is just a little bit more of some of the work I've done. I participated in Ghost River, which is an exhibit at the Library Museum um, in Philadelphia last year, and um, I made a wampum belt all on naturally dyed milkweed fiber, which is another of our traditional materials, and that's in the lower bottom of the um, screen. Um, that's just a close-up of a, a pretty good-sized wampum belt made from handmade um, shell disc beads. The um, Fruitlands Museum, Concord Museum also have examples of my natural dye work, um, more so I think quill work in those museums, so you can all take a look at the native galleries and those places to see some of the colors that you can achieve with different materials as well. Um, so that's the end of my PowerPoint. Right now I have a square frame. So if you all got the instructions in advance for the workshop, what you need is a square frame. It could be a stretcher bar. You know, I'm using um, just reclaimed material. I, I reclaimed an old, um, you know, photograph frame. So any, um, anything really that works that's in this shape um, is fine. And then I'm just reaching, okay, I've got my yarn. This is my thread that I'm gonna use for the warp. I've got a pair of scissors. Um, on the list is corn husk and a bowl of water. I have my corn husk soaking now and I have dyed corn husk that I had prepared for this presentation. And so what you need to do first is um, take your thread and I'm going right up to the top of my frame. You can just see the back of my frame here. And I'm just gonna go ahead and tie a square knot pretty tight. Um, doesn't have to be terribly tight, but you know, so, so that it doesn't slip out. And so that's the beginning of setting up your warp, which are the vertical threads that you're actually going to weave around. And what I do is I basically overwrap the frame and you're going to see as I do so, I'm actually kind of pinching the thread on the frame and controlling the tension um, as I go. And I'm just spacing it out at maybe a quarter of an inch apart or so. Um, not too close because corn husk is actually a fairly thick material even when you split it down. Um, so you don't wanna have them necessarily much closer than quarter of an inch apart, you know, or four ends per inch is what we would say, I guess, in, in weaving terminology, if I was setting up a bigger, bigger loom. So I'm gonna go ahead and set up a few inches on that. And if you're making the project at home, you can kind of adapt it to whatever size you'd like. If you want to create a bigger piece that um, is supposed to be a decorative wall hanging, you can warp it to be a much wider piece at five or six inches or seven inches across. The more ends you put in, the wider the piece is, it is, the longer it's going to take you to weave. So it's not going to be, you know, just a quick hour's work uh, to weave a, a big long piece with a bunch of color in it and a bunch of creative, um, complicated patterns, the more that um, you add into the project, the longer it's gonna take. So it might be something that you pick up and you work on for an hour each day if you wanna create something larger in your spare time. Or you could do several small pieces as your proficiency with the medium grew 
and as you got used to dyeing some corn husk as well. And so it's something that you can come back to with more skills. So I'm, I have a couple of inches here. I'm gonna go, I think, narrow so that you can see me go across and also turn a corner um, so you can see how I finish the ends off. The material I'm weaving with is actually what I would consider a fairly short fiber. Um, so corn husk is just like, you know, six, seven inches, eight inches maybe long on average. And so you end up with a lot of ends that could stick out, but you can really continue weaving and tuck those ends in. And so you're going to see when I start my weaving, how I immediately start tucking the ends in. When it dries later on, um, I could then cut it off the loom, cut off any ends that happen to be sticking out in the back, and so that it's nice and neat and finished looking. The other thing you could do if you like the ends is let the ends stick out on either side um, of your woven piece and it just becomes more of the, the decorative texture. And so either looks really, really nice. Corn husk is really appealing. Um, let me see if I can do this seasonal material. I'm gonna hang this up behind me. And I'm gonna just make sure I'm in the frame. This is always tricky in Zoom. And then I'm gonna actually start my, my weaving process. I have my corn husk that I have been soaking for a few minutes. It really just takes you know five or 10 minutes to, to soak your corn husk. Um, you take it, put it in the water. Once it's um, totally moistened, it gets quite soft. It goes from basically feeling like cardboard to pretty flexible. You can see it here. It's nice and flexible. I then split it. I don't have full thickness corn husk that I weave with because it's very, very bulky. And so unless I really needed that bulky texture, I would split it down to something that was a, a more comfortable width. This is fairly narrow, um, but you can, you can go wider if you want to. The weaving will go faster if you have wider pieces. So that's another thing to think of. What also makes a texture quite pleasant is if you give it a little bit of a twist. The twist won't all stay in it. Some of it will come out as you go, but it will just sit really neat. Um, and it'll just compact, I think, a little bit easier too. What I'm doing here at my loom, for any of you who might be um, experienced in weaving, it's an over-under weave. It's a plain weave. So you go over one thread, under the next, over one thread, under the next. And um, I'm gonna bring my loom closer to the camera once I've done a row. Um, this is where the tension becomes important. So I'm gonna go under, over, under, over, under, over, under, over, all the way across. Slide my piece through. That's my first row. I'm gonna draw it so the end is right near the edge and maintain some of the twist. And then I'm going to turn the corner with this piece and do the opposite. So over, under, over, under, all the way across. And so each row is opposite to the one previous. If you went over a thread, when you come back around, to go the other way, you're going to go under it and vice versa. And so I've turned a corner. You can see that it's a fairly um, neat way to finish the edge. I'm gonna turn the corner on this side and weave back going opposite to what I just did as well. And that end is just gonna get tucked in. And this end also that I started with can also get tucked under. Um, and then I'll you know, basically finish it off by trimming it when I'm done. So this is my next piece. It's a little wide, so I'm gonna split it. I'm giving it my twist. And I'm going to start right where I left off. So I'm gonna overlap a little bit. So the last two or three stitches that I did with the end, I'm gonna go over again. And then over, under, over, under, over, under. And then I turn the corner over, under, over, under, over, under, over, under. And then what I'm gonna do at this point, as I weave and I pack it down, I use my fingers to compress it. Um, you could also use a kitchen fork if you've accrued a lot of weaving and you wanna compress it. A kitchen fork is, is a wonderful weaving tool that everybody has in their house. Um, so that is a good one to keep in mind. And I'm gonna reach over and get some of the really nicely colored um, black walnut corn husk that I have here. These leaves are nice and wide. 
Um, they take a dye beautifully. So berries, black, you could use blackberries, maybe add some vinegar to, um, you know, more than the color, make sure it's permanent. Um, just simmer it in the dye. Petals, roots, oak galls, if you like walking the woods this time of year, you can find oak galls right on the forest floor that you can use. The only thing I would be careful of with natural dyes is just make sure that, you know, you know, if you happen to have any allergies to materials, obviously don't use those materials. Um, so just be careful of, of any sensitivities you have. So I did over under, over under. You can see I gave it a little bit of a twist again um, and I'm setting it in exactly where I want it to sit. And you can see the contrast. I'm going to do the opposite now and I'm going to weave back. It's a little bit of dye is on my fingers now, but it's nothing, um, you know, it's not really strong enough in this case to be permanent or anything. So I don't have to worry about that. It's non-toxic. Um, the only thing with nut husks that you want to watch is if you did have a nut allergy, it could be an issue. Um, and the other thing is I don't ever let my pets anywhere near my natural dyes, just in case they had issues. Black walnut is definitely not good for animals. Um, so it's not the sort of thing that you'd leave your natural dye material out where a dog could get it or something. The finished product is fine. It's not going to bother anybody. Once it's set and dried, it's not really going to go anywhere. And I'm just glancing at my time to make sure I'm good. Um, so I'm going to start now with another natural piece. Um, and I can bring this closer. So this is the weaving that I've done so far. So I've just started with the natural, added the black walnut. I'm going to add some more natural again. And I'm going to see if I can hold this a little closer to my camera. This is the thing that's always tricky in Zoom, right? Um, Let's see if I can set this up like this. So basically I'm gonna do the weaving. I can see my last row and I have to do the opposite, right? So over, under, over, under. There's gonna be overlap in the same stitch with the, the end of the black walnut there, but that's fine. Overlap is fine with weaving. In weaving there typically isn't a lot of knots. There's just really good tight weaving, compacted weaving um, that holds all of your threads in place. And you know, once you've done a hundred rows or something, there's a lot of pressure on those previous rows to stay, stay put, essentially. So you can see I give it a little bit of twist and then I do my weaving. I'm going to go ahead and turn the corner. So I'm going to go two or three stitches over, under, over, under, oops, sliding out. Um, I'm gonna let it sit in the back. So it's not sticking up and that keeps my edge nice and neat. So you can see if you use a bunch of colors to dye your materials, you can create maybe some circles in orange this time of year. Um, you could create a range of colors from the brown to a lighter version of the black walnut to create a tan to some nice yellow um, from the sunflower petals as well. And so it's sort of really up to you. You could do greens and blues if you're more um, of a person who likes that shade range and go from there. And you can see it's starting to shape up and have about an um, inch, inch and a half of weaving. You can compress it further. Right now you can see some of the warps, which is some of the, the vertical elements in the weave, which is fine. You can, however, continue to weave and continue to compress it while it's still moist, not after it's dried. And you can completely cover your warp as well. It depends on how you want your material to work. The warp can be part of your art. So if you want to do a warp, um, which are these elements that was half purple and half orange, um, then weave on this with different colored corn husk, then you'd have a more of a multicolored piece. And in that case, maybe you'd want to see some of your warp coming through because it adds to your particular um, 
piece of art. And so you can see it's, it's setting up. I can grab some more of the black walnut and I could start doing um, different shapes that I could weave around as well. So I'm gonna go in this end, kind of tuck this behind. Weave the opposite, come back out, and then go back. So I'm just going back and forth in one section, and then I will weave the, the natural color um, to meet it. So there actually will be a little bit of a gap in the weaving if I want, or I could interlock it and create sort of a blending of color at that intersection. This is my natural, turning the corner with that end, and then I'm going to tuck it behind. So you can see very little is sticking up. This is just a little end here, but it's not a big deal. I can trim that. I can trim this. Anything sticking in behind, I can trim later on as well. Usually, I let my corn husk sit for a few hours and really start drying thoroughly before I trim it or take it off the loom or mess with it too much. Um, you could take it off the loom before then, but you might want to cut it off and actually knot these ends together at either end of your piece so that your corn has to, husk doesn't slip off of your actual weaving. Um, so it's sort of um, up to you how you want to settle it. You don't necessarily want to over soak your corn husk, leave it soaking and or leave your project super wet um, because after a while if it's left wet, corn husk will mildew like most other natural materials. It's fine to keep it moist while you're working with it, but if you're gonna put it down for a few hours, you can just put it down and let it dry out. You don't have to um, you know, spray it with water or anything like that to keep it moist when you're not actually in the act of weaving. So I wove that to meet the brown. I'm gonna weave back out this way. Let's start this end. draw that through. And I can actually go over the brown a little bit if I want to, so that there's kind of a, an interlocking, almost dovetail type design with the natural and the brown. And so you can see that closer. The texture is really nice. It's a fairly thick material. Um, it has a little bit of a springy quality to it. And so it's pretty fascinating um, and really durable. You can scale this up and you could make a mat for your entryway if you wanted to, um, as well as you know something decorative for the wall. You could use it to uh, make a hot plate or trivet essentially in a way um, to use on a table under hot pans or something like that as well, or something of that nature. So if anyone has any questions on the technique or materials prep, I'm happy to, um, to take those as I go along. I'll do a little bit more.
one nice thing about the loom setup is it, it's elegantly simple and you can just use a variety of materials. If you don't want to use a whole frame, then you could certainly just commandeer some cardboard, uh, you know, in a square or rectangular shape and set up your loom on that, essentially your warp on that. And, um, you know, just use your materials. The only thing about cardboard is it doesn't stand up well to moist materials touching it. So you can expect if you're going to use that, it's just going to be a short, you know, one or two hour class. You finish your piece, maybe cut it off right away and knot it um, so that it doesn't start maybe um, melting or degrading the cardboard and possibly affecting your art. Nice thing about corn husk is it's a renewable material. It's a natural material. Um, you could use an item that you made out of it if you were using it uh, for practical items like basketry or matting. Those kinds of things tend to be useful for a period of time and then they wear out with daily use or seasonal use. And so each year when you're harvesting your corn, you can decide how much of the leaves or how much of the corn husk you want to go ahead and prepare clean, dry, maybe dye, so that you have a constant supply of new weaving material for, for your containers and things like that that you need for your household. Tuck that end just so it doesn't get distracting. Corn husk is interesting too in that depending on the type of corn that you're growing, the corn husk itself might have some natural coloration. There are ears of corn that have um, corn husk that is naturally kind of reddish in color or maroon in color. And so that can add um, a lot of nice natural color to your piece without you having to actually go ahead and dye a portion of it for a contrasting color or you could do a solid piece in the, the natural with no color, or you could do a solid piece in something like that red um, without even having to, to add the step of dyeing it. Other things that you could do just experimentally with this is you could weave a piece, whether or not you had added any of the dyed corn husk, and then experiment with maybe non-toxic markers. Um, some of my students have taken paints and painted over their weavings afterwards. So there's a pattern independent of the weaving technique um, that they can realize by simply using some, some painting um, over the material. This is really thick. I'm gonna split this down actually. This is a really thick piece. Go like this. Pull this down. And then make sure this is in place. And start my weaving. I'm going to weave almost all the way across with the natural. And didn't stay tucked.
just compressing it a little bit. So you can see I'm using my fingers. I can do that because it's nice and moist. Um, you won't find that corn husk is particularly easy to compress. Once it's dry, it pretty much becomes like cardboard again, essentially. It's very crinkly. It has a very nice, uh, it creates this nice sound when you touch it, um, but you're not gonna be able to manipulate it nicely like I'm doing right now, you know, where I can push it basically to cover, if I want to, all of or most of my warp threads and create a nice thick textured material. And you can see the sort of dovetail technique I'm doing over here. You could do a series of squares and different colors going up. You could do, you know, half circles and sections of it. And you could just keep going as, as long as you wanted to essentially. And then dry it out. And if you wanted to hang it up, you could do that. Just, I'm reaching off camera to, uh, to split my corn husk here. Here's some more. And give it the little twist. And I think I'll just go all the way across. See how that looks. So I'm just going um, basically over, under, over, under. I think I need to start and then turn the corner to do it well. It's kind of anchored. This is a plain weave. Any of you who want to experiment with other types of weaves also, um, you can find a variety of sources online that talk about a plain weave versus a twill weave versus a herringbone weave, for instance. Um, those are ways that you can create patterns even without a color change, sh simply by changing the number of threads you're going over. I can demonstrate, I can do an under one over two twill. Um, and so I'm gonna go under one, over two, under one, over two, under one, over two. And just gonna give it a little bit of a twist and compress it. And so it's going to look a little bit different from the weave that I was just doing um, before. And I continue the weave. I have to overlap the ends a little bit, turn the corner. And let me just figure out, so that was, okay. So I'm gonna go under one, over two, under one, over two, under one. And that's my dog, excuse me. And then just do the weaving that way. The design is a little bit different. You get sort of these broad, stretches for the stitch instead of these really dense, tiny stitches in the weaving. Um, the appearance is just, just a little bit different. We've got over two, under one, over two, under one, over two, and then compress it. So you start to see it's sort of, um, it's sort of a, a bigger, kind of stitch, so you, you don't have exactly the same texture. It adds a lot of interest. You could do many variations of the twill. So instead of going under one over two, you could do an equal one of under two over two. You could do, um, your stitch sequence could be something like under one over three or over four, if you have enough ends per inch to make, to support that weaving. And it's basically just gonna cause this kind of slight bias where there's like these stitches showing up in a diagonal across the face of your fabric. And like the other type of weaving, the plain weaving I was just doing a minute ago, as long as you're taking the time to compress your weaving, and as long as you knot the ends once you cut it off the, the loom, knot the ends close to, up close to your weaving on the top and the bottom, it's really not going to come out or go anywhere. Um, so just make sure that you go ahead and take the time to finish off the piece properly.
Try the same stitch in the natural. I generally think of this as a seasonal activity, but really if you draw your corn husk and store it, or if you go to the supermarket, you can pretty much buy corn husk year round because people also use it, um, of course, in cuisine. Uh, tamales and things like that are made with um, corn husk. Uh, indigen other indigenous people, um, you know, Native Americans in the Northeast here, including Wampanoags, make boiled bread sometimes in corn husk or boiled meats that are seasoned in corn husk wrapped up as well. And so it's pretty much available year round for whatever you might want to use it for. In addition to the basketry and matting, we, um, you know, at various time periods have made shoes out of corn husk that are pretty uh, interesting looking and sounding. And sandals uh, are great as well. And then of course, there are a lot of native artists that do school programs demonstrating the corn husk doll technique. And those are ways of making corn husk dolls that are, you know, typically used by children to entertain themselves. They, you know, can decorate their corn husk doll a little bit if they want to, or they could use it really plain and just have a nice time with it. And so you can see how this looks. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this light on in case it makes it a little bit more easy to see some of the details. Um, yeah, and so you're, you can pick up that texture. This is just a few couple of inches of weaving, um, but you can continue to add and continue to compress. See me um, compressing it. I just try to make it fairly even as I go along. Sometimes it's not perfect. It'll get a little warped, but you can go back and fix that a little bit if it does start to move. So that's corn husk weaving. So I think I'll take any questions if anybody has any. Um, I can glance at the chat. Okay, it doesn't look like I have any posted. Um, or if anybody has anything to share. I'm happy to troubleshoot as well. I'm going to split up some more corn husk. Yeah, and I hope that everyone following along, even whether you had materials or not, um, even if you didn't have materials, could later on gather some and attempt this at home. And like Elizabeth said, be creative, use your own materials that you have at home and have at your disposal. Um, someone is asking if it's tough enough to make a bag. Definitely, it's super tough. You could totally make yourself shopping bags out of corn husk. It would look really great. And I think it sends a great message to people as well of, Get away from plastic, please. Um, you could weave a long strip and fold it over and sew the sides. If you want to weave a tube and sew the bottom or not the bottom, you can do that as well. Um, there's, there's a bunch of different approaches, I think, to weaving a container. Um, you can also weave something shaped like a square basket or a round basket as well if you're more of a three-dimensional basketry person as well. So, yeah. I just want to say thank you so much for offering this to our audience. It's something that was long overdue and is so important and significant. So um, on behalf of the PEM team, the PEM staff, I just wanna say thank you so much for providing this. Certainly, thank you for having me. I'm gonna answer this question super quick. Um, so someone was asking me what the width is of the weaving. So I actually only set my loom up with like two and a half to three inch width. You can actually go as wide as you want. You're only gonna find the, the restriction on the weaving, right? Is really set by the size frame you start with. So if you start with a frame that's like eight by 12, you really wanna set your warp up so that it's in an inch 
because then you won't be fighting the edge of the frame to sort of get access to your threads, especially if the tension is really tight. You're going to find if you've got tight, tight cordage right to the edge, it's going to make it, you're going to get annoyed every time you get to one of the salvage edges to try to turn the corner and, and keep your weaving nice and neat. So just giving yourself room to breathe when you set up. That's, that's really the only restriction. And if you want to go larger, just make yourself a bigger frame. You can always corner bracket it. So. And I see the question, did people make wearables with corn hats? Yes, um, the, the one that I'm most familiar with because there was a pair in a museum where I worked was a pair of corn husk shoes. Um, they were really fascinating, they basically, essentially corn husk moccasins. I thought that was the neatest thing ever. Um, and I've seen uh, sandals made from corn husk as well. I'm not as familiar with it being used um, for clothing per se, like, you know, a skirt or something like that. Um, I think finer materials, finer grasses and things were sometimes used for like a skirt or um, another article of clothing or a nice hat. Uh, I think corn husk can get a little thick and a little bulky and uh, I'm not sure that it, it's got a refined texture so it's a little hard to control for a bigger piece that you're going to wear. Yeah, so again, thank you Elizabeth, thank you everyone for joining us today, um, for participating and for uh, being a part of this workshop and it lets us know what to look forward to for future programming. Great. Best of luck. Happy Indigenous Peoples Day, everybody. Happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Thank you.